very first time words of introduction. I would like to thank the elder Lynn Monroe, who she was speaking here today. But when the pastor and the first elder asked if he would allow me to speak today, because today is his time to speak, the elder gave way. And the elder Lynn Monroe, that is a sign of a great leader. You are risen above self-abnegation. Some of us will insist that it is my son I'm going to preach. <laughs> God bless you. You have been a leader for many years. I would like to thank your pastor, Pastor Alan Thompson. When I spoke to him this week that I'm out in town, I'm here in primary to see my mother to spend some time with her. That is my mission here. And then I told Pastor Thompson that very likely I'd be stopped by, very likely I'd be stopped by here today. And he asked me to share a word. At first I said to myself, when you're on vacation, you need to take the time. You need to take the time, amen? Yeah. But it is hard for me to say no to someone like Pastor Thompson. When I started out 29 years ago, I started out with him. He was my senior pastor. And over the years, he has been a big brother and a leader to me. So I'm grateful for his leadership. There's another reason I accepted that invitation to share with you today. Every now and again, I hear news coming from Church Street. And many of you are doing well. Amen? I'm grateful for your accomplishments. But there's some sad news coming from this congregation. I think the latest, Brother Elder Devon Allen, your dear wife. Your former pastor and I were talking, Pastor Johnson, and Johnson told me of the event, and we prayed with Brother Allen. I saw him earlier this morning, just a short exchange, and he said, on a day like today, today sad, coming to church and his wife is not here. It is really painful. I said, what you know what I'm talking about? Even though many times we come to church and start really dressed up, the truth is we're all messed up. We're wounded. But praise God, as a church, we're resilient. We're what? It was Winston Churchill who said, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. And I know that the members of this congregation, they have the courage to continue. If you believe that, say amen. amen. So we will not give up, we will not give in. Because Jesus is coming again. My wife would like to extend greetings uh, to you and also the children. And also, I would like to bring greetings from the Malton and the Bolton congregations that I serve. Alright, so let me just go right into a word from the Lord. Recently I've been doing a study and I've been looking at some of the, the names of God revealed in the Bible. I must confess I am on name number one. There are, there are many names. The Bible is replete with names of God and each name is compacted with theological significance that will encourage us and inspire us to hold on till Jesus comes. So I've been looking at this name of God, the angel of the Lord. I must confess I've reached far in this preparation, but I know enough to share with you today. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe that the title, the angel of 
the Lord is a name for God. Let me say that to those who believe that. That the angel of the Lord is a designation of the Lord. Not many. Now, you don't believe that in the name. Okay. And I can understand. I hope you have the Bible. Because this is the Bible class. Amen. 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 Now I can understand why many persons will not accept that the title or the name, the angel of the Lord, is a direct reference to the Lord. When we think of angels in the Bible, we know that they are created beings. According to Hebrews 1 and verse 14, there are ministering spirits sent to protect, to serve those who will inherit eternal life. And so many individuals will find it very difficult to accept that the angel of the Lord is the Lord himself. Now, the phrase angel of the Lord in the Hebrew is Malek Yahweh. Malek Yahweh. From the Hebrew word means sent. It means deputy. One from whom God works to execute his will. It implies a certain degree of subordination. That's why many believe he could never be the Lord himself. I would like to ask to say right now that the angel of the Lord is not like the angels of God. And there's a distinction in Bible that the angel of the Lord is in a different class and category than the angels that are mentioned in scripture. And for the interest of time, I would like to share with you three references. And you don't need to be any film note to just read your Bible and it's clear that the angel of the Lord is the theophany or the physical manifestation of God himself. Just three references. As a matter of fact, there are 65 references in the Old Testament where you find the expression, the angel of the Lord. There are 65. And many Bible scholars and writers agree that this is none other than the Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so in light of what I've been hearing from one to the church, I am impressed to share with you this title of God because it is loaded, it is, as it were, filled with messages of hope for us as we grapple with the challenges we face. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I ask now that your Holy Spirit will speak for me as I open your word. May Christ be seen, be heard, and be exalted. In his name I pray. Amen. Amen. How many references were we going to look at? How many? Three references. We begin with Genesis chapter 16 and verse 6 to 13. A little background of this passage. Sarah came up with an idea that her mistress or her maid should be Abraham's second wife. Because the Lord had restrained her from having children. And even though she was mindful that God said she will be the mother of a promised son. They waited for about 25 years 
And it seems as if God will not fulfill his promise. And so, Sarah came up with this idea that her maid should be her husband's wife. Now let us struggle. You must never share your spouse under no condition, under no circumstances. If you believe that, say amen. amen. So the Bible says, Agar, that is Sarah's maid, was pregnant. And because of this, she was so boastful. And she flattered herself that she would be the mother of a great nation who would be, as it were, the people of God. And so she became very disrespectful to her mistress and there was war at home. Conflict. Two women, one man. Problem. And so the Bible says Sarah complained to Abraham to send her away. Abraham was hesitant because she's pregnant with his child. And Abraham thought that this child would be the promised one. The one that God promised them. How would I send her away? And then Abraham heeded to the, the voice of his wife. So we pick up the narrative from Genesis 16, verse 6 to 13. And the wife says, So Abraham said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. Wow. Look at Sarai's response. So she turned the body harshly with her, and she fled from her presence. She was in the wilderness. And here we find maybe one of the first references of the angel of the Lord. The Bible says in verse 7, Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. Not just the location. And the Bible says by the spring of the way to serve. In other words, it seems as if she was going back to Egypt. The Bible tells us in chapter 16 that she's from Egypt. So she was an Egyptian. The angel of the Lord found her. And notice in verse 8. And he said, Agar, Sarai's name, where have you come from. And where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. I said, many of us are like Agar. Sometimes we are blessed by God and we forget where we're coming from. But every now and again, God needs to remind us where we're coming, where we're coming from. And the truth is, if we keep fresh in our minds where we're coming from, we have nothing to fear for the future unless we forget the leading of God in our lives. Where are you coming from? Maybe this is true to someone here today who was a former member of the church, but you have drifted. God is asking, where are you coming from? A well-disciplined home. A home that embraced the word of God. Where are you coming from? And the question is, where are you going? The angel of the Lord found her in the wilderness. And notice his approach to this woman who was like a, a refugee, you would say. I flee from the presence of my mistress. Verse 9, again, the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly. I will do it. Which angel can be 
is such a declaration. I will do it, he says, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael. Yes, because the Lord has heard your affliction. This is the first time in the Bible a child is named before he was born. This child is Ishmael. And many of you are mindful by just reading the Bible and going through history that this is the father for Islam. So before Islam came on the scene, the Malek Yahweh, the messenger of God, saved that nation by saving their progenitor. Ishmael was saved by the Malek Yahweh, the angel of God. And the angel of the Lord named him and said he will be great. Notice Agar's response to this revelation of the angel of the Lord. The Bible says in verse 12, this is the description of Ishmael. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man and every man's hands against him. In verse 13, then she, that is Agar, called the name of the Lord. And the word Lord here is Adonai, or Yahweh, the covenant keeping God. She called the name of the angel of the Lord, who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. What a name for God. You are the God who, who sees. The Hebrew says it is El Rohi or El Rai. He's the God who sees. What a God we serve. Yes. For she said, have I also have seen him who sees me? The God who sees me from the Hebrew speaks volume to us today. El Roy, the angel of the Lord. He's the one who numbers the hairs on our heads. He's the one who counts every tear we shed. He knows every detail about our circumstances. He is the God who sees. He sees with compassion. He sees with understanding. He sees with empathy. God knows whether Alan, what you're going through. Only God knows what many of us are facing today. And I'm so happy that he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. The Bible says in all our afflictions, he is afflicted. He is Elohim, the God who sees with understanding, the God who sees with compassion, the God who sees with empathy, the God who sees us with mercy. What a God we serve today. What a God we serve. Consider Agar's predicament. Running away from her home, she's pregnant. Based on the location, on her way back to Egypt, she could never make a journey. And God intervened, saved her, the child, and blessed them. What a God we serve. The next reference of the angel of the Lord. Is the text that we read for our scripture reading. The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 3 that he appeared to Moses from the burning bush. This is a 
the enemy, the manifestation, the physical manifestation of God. Look at it, the bush is burning, yet not consumed. That is divine power. Notice this was not a cedar tree or one of those oak. It was a bush. It speaks of his condescension so that Moses could see him and live. He chose a bush. Not the majestic palm tree. He chose a bush. This represents his condescension to meet us at our level. He said to Moses, I have seen his Elohim. He sees what we're going through. He said, I, I, I see the affliction of my people. I have heard their cry. And now I have come down to deliver them. What a God we serve. When Moses said, God, yes, but when I go to the people and say, to them that the God of our Father sent me and they asked, what is your name? Exodus chapter 3. God said, tell them that I am. That I am. The eternal one. The Alpha and the Omega. The great El Shaddai. I am He. Notice in the passage for their deliverance and I'm moving forward to chapter 14. When fear came against Israel, the Bible says that fear gathered his chariots. Not just any chariots, his elite chariots. Men of war, but not just any in a person of war. This is like the naval sea. And they ask, who is that naval seal? These are the soldiers who went for Osama bin Laden. This is the Delta Force of Egypt. And they are going for Israel. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 14 that God led Israel by the Red Sea. It was the angel of the Lord who went with them. And he killed them at the Red Sea. And God said, Pharaoh would say they are trapped. They cannot escape. But this was God's ambush for Pharaoh and the Egyptian. And just in case you don't know what Egypt was then, just speak of the United States of America, the world's superpower. What Egypt was then, United States of America is today the superpower. And it was the angel of the Lord who took on this powerful nation. God. Because God revealed to Abraham in Genesis that my people would be in Egypt for 400 years. And after 400 years, I will deliver them. God. The Bible tells us in Exodus 13 that when the clock struck 400 years, not a day after, yes, not a day before. Yeah, There's an expression that is used in Exodus. It says on the self same day. Yes. I think that's Exodus 13 verse 21. On the self same day when the clock struck 400 years, God delivered his people. God. What a God is yes. Imagine Pharaoh is closing in on the people of Israel. Oh, and they cried out and in this pregnancy, Moses had stand still and will see the salvation of the Lord. Yes, and the people were terrified and they were petrified. Oh, then Melech Yahweh, yes. the angel of his covenant, he was going before the army. And the Bible said, in a pillar of cloud, now look at the scene. Majestically, he moved the Bible says, from the front of the army. And he went over the army and he stood between the pursuers and the pursuit so that it could not come one against another. That is the angel of the Lord. The Bible says in the morning watch, midnight, the morning watch, he looked through the clouds upon the Egyptian and he took off their wings. The doctor 
us know that when a person is about to die, near the first part of um, dies, if their feet are alone for two that is, that you cannot run. So can you imagine when God took off the wheels of it is right there in Exodus 14. They cannot run. It was the angel of the Lord. Now many are not convinced that he is, and I'm going somewhere before I close. I'm going somewhere. I have one more reference to give you that this is the Messiah, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Genesis 22. Look at Genesis 22 quickly. You know that God called Abraham? God said to Abraham that he should what? Offer his son as a what? Sacrifice unto me. Not just the person who's speaking, unto me. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 10, and Abraham, the time came now for Abraham to sacrifice his son. Are we still together? Yeah. The altar is built. Isaac is on the altar. And Isaac is the father, you could say, of the Jewish nation. Because the Jews came from the lineage of Isaac. So what we're seeing in the Middle East today, the Palestinians are a mass. And Israel, the Jews, their two brothers were fighting. Yes, and both nations were saved by the Amen, the Malek Yahweh. Yes. Look at him saving Israel now. Yes. So Isaac is on the altar. Yes. Abraham stretched out his hand, verse 10, and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham. Abraham. And so he answered, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad, or do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God. Look at the language that you fear God, since you have not preserved your son, your only son, from me. That is the angel of God speaking. The Malek Yahweh is speaking. This is not just another angel. This is the Lord Himself. You have not withheld your son from me. First thirty that Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a ticket by its horns. And so Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. He calls the name of the place, the Lord God provide. Hebrew Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The Bible says, look, brethren, if, if, if you forget everything, I don't need to be a scholar. You just need to read the Bible. And this is what the Bible says in verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time, for me carefully, and said, By myself. You see that in the Bible? That is a sermon by itself. The angel said, by my what? Self. I have what? Have what? I have sworn, says the Lord. Because you have done this, and you have not tell your son, your only son. Notice the language here. We have seen this in the Bible before. When he called Abraham from his native land to bless him, notice he's repeating the same promise he made to the Father. Abraham, he says, bless him, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and as the sandwiches upon the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of your enemies. In your sea, all the nations, including Jamaica, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have 
obey my voice. Now, allow me just to pause here to look at the phrase by myself. Exodus 22, verse 16. Paul, the greatest lady theologian, Paul who wrote 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament, Paul commented on the phrase, I myself, I, I swear by myself. Look what Paul says quickly. Hebrews 6 and verse 13. Don't miss this. Uh, this is the word of God. This must be the Lord himself. Are you there? Paul speaking about this, he says in Hebrews 6 verse 13, For when God made a promise to Abraham, and what just read for us, right? Because he could swear by no one greater. Are you still with me? God could not swear by anyone greater. He swore by myself. <laughs> Say, surely I will, surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained a promise. We could go on and on. But I think I've made the point that the angel of the Lord is the Lord himself. When the Bible speaks of the angel of the Lord, the Malek Yahweh, I like his manifestation in a physical way. He's coming near to us. He's coming near to us. Each time the Melech Yahweh shows up in scripture, it seems to be a crisis. It was a crisis for Ava in the wilderness. She's about to die. He shows up. When Abraham was about to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, he shows up. When God was about to deliver Israel from Egypt, the angel of the Lord shows up. When Joshua was about to take Jericho, and the Bible says that Jericho was fortified. Fortified. It was shut up. This was a formidable time. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 4 and chapter 6 that the, the angel of the Lord showed up. And when Joshua saw him, he had a sword. He was of a lofty stature. Joshua never saw any soldier look like him. When Joshua saw him, Joshua chapter 5, Joshua said, tell me, are you for us or against us? He said, no. But I come as the captain I'm God. of the Lord's host. Yes. I am the Melak Yahweh. Yes, I am your deliverer. Yes. Notice my brothers and sisters. Even though he is called the angel of the Lord, he's not an angel. For example, the president of the United States of America, um, President Biden, because of his office as president, he is commander. In chief. The president is not a soldier. When Obama was president, he was commander in chief. So the Melek Yahweh is commander in chief. Angels delight to execute his will. He gives the command. He's the one who is our defender and our deliverer. And I say, praise the Lord. So each time he appears in scripture, there seems to be a the Bible tells us in Galatians 4 and verse 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent, and the word sent is associated with messenger. God sent for his son to be what? To be born of a woman, to deliver them that who were under the law. The fullness of time. This was another 
in a moment. Can I share with you what was taking place when he showed up the first time? The incarnate Son of God. The book Education by Energy White. One of the spiritual leaders of the Sydney Adventist Church. Ellen White says when he came in the book Education, page 75, when Christ came to the earth, humanity seemed to be fast reaching its lowest point. I'm talking about when the, the, the Melet Yahweh came the first time. Humanity was fast reaching its lowest point. As he always shows up at a defining moment. We're told that the, the very foundation of society were undermined. It sounds like today. Life had become false and artificial. The Jews, destitute of the power of God's word, gave to the world mind, the numbing soul, deadening traditions and speculations. The worship of God in spirit and truth had been supplanted by the glorification of men in an endless throne of man-made ceremonies. I'm talking about when he came the first time. Through the world, through the what? Through the world, all systems of religion were losing their hold upon the mind and soul. Disgusted with fables and fashion, seeming to drown the thought, men turned to infidelity like today. Materialism like today, losing eternity out of their reckoning. They live for the present like today. I'm talking about when it came at the first time. As they cease to organize the divine, they cease to regard the human truth. Other integrity, confidence, compassion were departing from the earth. Look at what is taking place right now in the Middle East. Both sides are wrong. Amen? Both sides are wrong. Hamas attacking Israel is wrong. To kill many innocent people, they are wrong. And I would like to submit also that Israel response to me seems to be very wrong. Buildings with people, innocent people, lives are lost. That is also wrong. I said, war is never a good thing. That's why we need a savior. Who can bring peace and happiness and there could be gladness for everyone. Notice my brothers and sisters, when he came, were taking place as the evil passions and purposes of men banished God from their thoughts so forgetfulness of him inclined them more strongly to evil the heart in love with sin flowed within its own attributes and this concept strengthened the power of sin they have a misguided notion of who God is and so they did evil. Notice when he came the first time. We're told that the light appeared when the world was the darkness. Says LG White. Yes, the light appeared when the darkness was the greatest. God's greatest gift was restored to meet man's greatest need. Jesus came. He came the right time. And when he came, he came to save a world that was perishing. At his baptism, he was empowered by the Spirit of God. And when he went to church after 40 days of fasting, he said, The Spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to give sight to the blind, to heal broken hearted. That is the work of the Messiah. That was his, his mission statement. And he saves in Luke 19 10 that the Son of Man, he came to see and to save the lost. And yes, close him. He's coming again. Oh, God. He's coming again. Yes. Because the world is at that tipping point. And destruction is looming. Uh, we suffer from one crisis to another. A few days ago, we were talking about the war between Hamas, Hamas, and Israel. And then we heard about some man in the United States of America. One man killed 18 persons. Another mass shooting in that country. Shout out to the war between Hamas and Israel. 
He said, Adam and Eve sinned. And then the next Yahweh showed up. And he said to Eve, in sorrow, you will give birth. Notice the language. This is the beginning of sorrow. Some people are out there, well, well, we haven't seen wars ever you know, before. This Google war. There are so many wars that are now taking place as we speak. What about natural disasters? Oh, we are inundated with natural disasters, fire, flood. You'll never be happy. So some people are saying this will never be the sign that is coming again. Well, what they fail to recognize when he said these are the beginning of sorrows. The imagery is of a woman in child's birth. And all the mothers that are here, just raise your hand. All the mothers. You know when that time and my mother would tell her that I, I was born to queen. Yeah, so, some people say, um, that is true, right? But that is why I came to queen. I don't know if there's any significance to what that. But as the child approaches, as the baby is about to be delivered, and I'm just talking based on what I've heard. Yeah. I've never experienced that, right? Yes. I'm not hearing. Uh, when the time of gestation comes, the pain, uh, the sister comes, becomes more frequent and more intense because the baby is coming. Is that true? Yeah. Is that true? So we are seeing the frequency and the intensity of the problems. So it's a sign that Jesus is coming again. And when he comes, there will be no more sickness, no more pain. To someone here today, he says, let not your heart be troubled. He will even God will he answer me in my father's house in their main mansion. Just trying to reach to my mom. 
there's a big truck, a big, big truck on my left. The driver said he never saw me. The truck just moved into my little vehicle. Into my little vehicle. You know, life is so unpredictable. It could be worse. But thank God we are not left alone. Because the angel of the Lord.